What's up, Real Life family? We are so grateful for the opportunity to worship with you today. We're excited because we know that all it takes is one encounter with God to change your whole life, and we believe that day could be today. We would love it if you would share this experience. Click the share button or copy the link and send it to a friend. Also, be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay connected to your Real Life family. Well, it's about time to get started. Thanks again for joining us. So good to be with you, and we're on week four of Better By Far, which is our study on the book of Philippians, one of my favorite books of the Bible. If you go back and listen to old messages, you'll see that probably the most quoted book in any sermon, I'm I'm almost always referring back to Philippians because there's so much in this for us. So week four, we'll be in Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two, shout out to Mount Dora in Orlando and our online family. Let's make some noise for them. Thank you guys, love you. While you're turning to Philippians 2, all right, let me take you back to the year 1990. Anybody remember it? Were you there? 1990? Yeah, some of you are like, oh, Dad, we weren't, okay? 1990. Now listen, 1990, I was in high school. I, I was not only in high school, in fact, I was on the varsity high school basketball team because of my obvious size. I know. I was small, but I could ball, all right? There was, there was actually a season of my life where ball was life. Anybody in that season, like you're a baller, like that's it, you love basketball, you play all the time. So when you're a baller, like it literally is a way of life. I was playing tournament basketball, I was playing high school basketball, I was playing street ball all the time, I was playing church ball, that's the dirtiest of all of them. People were getting kicked out of churches because of their basketball game, it was wild. I would play one-on-one with anybody that would talk trash. This was like, I was into basketball. And if here's the thing, if you were into basketball in 1990, there was a standard, okay? There was one goat, one legend, one person that we all wanted to be like. And in my sometimes humble opinion, he still is the goat, the greatest of all time. Who am I talking about? MJ, come on. And some of you are like, well, you know, but here's the thing. Here's how you know he's the goat. Because anytime they bring up somebody else, who do they compare him to? The goat. Anyway, there you go. I won. Um, Back in the day, I'm telling you, it was, if you were playing basketball in the 90s, it was all Jordan. Jersey was Jordan. 23. The shoes were Jordan. They still are for a lot of people. All right. Uh, the, The shot was Jordan. We were all hanging our our arm and our wrist would hang there as long as possible. I'm telling you, in the 90s, we started playing basketball with our tongues out because of Jordan. It was the weirdest thing, guys coming up on each other because Jordan played with his tongue out and all of us from the 90s have scars from going up for layups and biting our tongues. But dude would play with his tongue out. He was amazing at it. And then we had a song, okay? Like for our generation, the song, it was every other commercial on TV and on the radio. Like Mike, if I could be like Mike, I want to be, I want to be like Mike. Anybody remember it? You will now. It's going to haunt your dreams. That one sticks there. That was the song. Like Mike, if I could be, it, man, if you were playing basketball in the 90s, the standard was Michael Jordan. And still today, I believe he's the standard by which all great players are measured against. As we uh, turn to Philippians 2, okay, so in Philippians 2, here's what I think Paul is doing. He is reminding us of the standard. He's raising the standard and reminding us that, hey, if you're going to do this thing, if you're going to walk the life of faith, if you're going to try to make it to heaven, if you're going to pursue God and find your purpose, there's one standard. There's one person you have to look to, and that's Jesus. That's it. Like Christ, there we go, like Christ If I could be like Christ, I want to be, I want to be. I thought you would join. Okay. I ruined it for some of you. I redeemed it for some of you. Okay, there you go. Like Christ, I want to be like Christ. This is what he says 
I, I love the way Paul puts this. So Philippians 2, verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, by the way, this is rhetorical. He's saying all of us who have entered into a relationship with Jesus, we've realized some benefits. And so he says, if, if you have any of these benefits, comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then since you're receiving these things from Christ, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Do not look to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset, in one version it says attitude, as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul is re-raising the standard and he's saying, hey, in Christianity, the standard is Christ. It always has been. He's it, he's the only, he's the way, he's the one. It's all about Christ. We have a model, we have a pattern, we have a goal, we have the goat, the greatest of all time is Jesus. And so when it comes to following God and pursuing our purpose in life, we don't have to look around for inspiration. We look up and we fix our eyes on Jesus, as it says in Hebrews, because we know that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. When it comes to living out faith, pursuing God, pursuing, per there's only one person that I need to look to, it's Jesus. He's it, he's all, and he stands alone. Paul says he's the name above all the other names. He's at the top of the list. If you're a baller, it's Jordan. If you're a believer, it's Jesus. Like Christ, if I could be like Christ. That's the goal. He's our standard. He's our model. He's our benchmark. He's the pattern, the example, the goal, the goat, the end game is Jesus. So our mindset, he says, our attitude, our, our thinking, our way of doing and being should be just like Jesus. That's the vision. Here's the question. How we doing? The vision is you and me are just like Jesus. The question is, how are we doing? I'll ask it this way because then you'll participate. I've made it too personal. All right. On a scale of one to 10, how is the church in America today doing at looking like Jesus? Scale of one to Jesus. We're, we got a two here. Okay. Um, the highest without going over actually wins today. I don't know that too many of us are say, accusing the church in America of looking way too much like Jesus. I think at times we look way too much like the culture and not enough like Jesus. Let me ask it this way, what if, this is a little more positive, what if Christians were a lot more like Christ? I know, that's pretty simple to preach, right? You're like, whoa, whoa, hold on. But, but think about it for a second. What would be different? And how different would it be if Christians, if the church was actually living and looking like Christ? What, what if the church was more interested in carrying the cross than carrying offense and hurt? What if we were so busy serving, we, we didn't have time to be shouting about things? What if the church was more caught up in being obedient than opinionated? Can you imagine? I wanna be like Christ. If we were like Jesus, so much would change. But that's too easy. It's too easy to sit on the sideline with a scorecard and judge and say, the church needs to do this and that. There's a whole bunch of small groups for that all over the world, right? You can go online and listen to all kinds of criticisms of the modern church. The, the thing about God's word is he didn't design it to be a magnifying glass, but he says it's a mirror. So I don't use the word of God. I don't hold it up to look for fault in others, but I hold it up to check myself. It's a mirror, not a magnifying glass. So as I hold up the mirror to my life, 
If the goal is I'm supposed to look like Jesus, how am I doing? Is the guy in the mirror looking more and more like the one that I'm following? It is the one I'm looking at in this reflection looking like the one that I'm supposed to be like? If that's the goal, when I look at me, do I see him? When the world looks at me, do they see him? Jesus is the standard, he's the model, he's the goal, he's the end game. In Romans, God says that he pre those he foreknew, he also predestined, he planned ahead, that the plan for those that I know are gonna follow my son, the plan is that they would be conformed to the image of Christ. That's the plan. He says, those of you who are gonna come to Christ, I already know, and, I, and those of you, the plan for your life is that you become like Christ. That's the standard. That's, and this is so incredibly important because without Christ, we don't have a standard. Without the benchmark, right? Like without the vision of what it's supposed to look like, we wouldn't know what it's supposed to look like. And we would do, well, hey, let's get together. We wanna follow God and we wanna get to heaven. What should we do? I don't know, let's form a committee. That always works out, right? Let's get a bunch of us together in a room and we'll kind of hash it out and then we'll come up with rituals and ceremonies and hats and, and designer things and a lot of, uh, maybe some sand art. I love that. You guys ever follow religion? I mean, it's all over the map. When we decide we gotta do something to get from here to there, what are we gonna do? We don't know what it's supposed to look like, but God said, hold on, I'm gonna come down there and show you. And, and through Jesus, divinity takes on humanity and he says, here's what it looks like. You're wondering what the way is. I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. This is the model. This is what it looks like. And so we don't have to argue, wonder, and fight with all of our different ideas and opinions, but we go, no, 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 we come to the cross. We come to Christ and we go, that's the standard. We, we come back to the original and we go, if that's what it's supposed to look like, how am I doing? I actually... Uh, I started a new project with some guys in the church and uh, we actually started a 90s cover band. That's not where you saw that going, I know, right? Some guys from the church, but the thing is we need this right now. Like it's, it's four, four of us guys in the church and we get into a garage and we play music really loud. And we really need this at this point in our lives because we're all married. So sometimes you need to be in a garage and play loud music with other guys. Anyway, we're having a great time. And, you know, 90s music is actually classic rock now, which is a super weird thing. I posted a little clip on Instagram like a month ago of us. Just that was like our first practice. We're getting together. We're playing songs. We're having fun. And here's the interesting thing, though, when you're in a cover band. Do you know what a, a cover band is when you are covering or playing someone else's music? I've been in both kinds of bands. And when you're in an original music band, so I've written a lot of music, a lot of people don't know that, it's been a long time. Uh, now I only play my original music for my wife, which works really well. Anyway, those nights go great. But there was a time where I would write music and we would play. When you're playing original music, this is the thing that that, you know what it's supposed to sound like. It lives inside you, it's in your head. And the hard thing is getting everybody else to conform. No, 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 less of that. Actually, I wanna hear more. You always need more cowbell, right? That's the thing, I want more of that, more of that. And, but when you're playing somebody else's music, when you're in a cover band, you already know what the standard is because they wrote it, they recorded it, they mastered it, they put it out, that's what it's supposed to sound like. And it's, you would think that would be easy, right? To just imitate the original, but four guys in the band, and what that means is we always have four opinions on what it's supposed to sound like or go in any direction. You come to a part in a song where you go, oh wait, I think right here is where he goes back to the chorus. Wait, I think right here actually is where he goes to the verse. No, I think this is the bridge. As a guitarist, it's always time for a solo. When in doubt, shred it out, that's the rule, right? Don't trip, rip, like just fill the space. So you start playing guitar and like, that's not where that goes. And it's so funny, here's what we do every practice. It never fails. At some point, we have to go, all right, stop, because we're all going different directions. And we actually hook the phone up to the PA system, and we go back and we listen to the original song. And we pause, we don't play, we listen and we learn from the original, and then what do we do? We do our best to imitate the original. Why am I telling you that? Because that's like exactly the definition of Christianity, right? And, and for you and I, what we gotta do? We gotta stop, and we gotta hold on. Go back to the original, listen to the original, learn from the original and go, I need to imitate that. 
We go back to Jesus. We go back to the beginning and the original, the one who kicked it off. Paul says, he's the one we gotta be looking at. Paul is like the original band leader and uh, he's trying to get everybody together in 1 Corinthians 11, 1. I love this. He says, therefore, here's what you gotta do. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. So I'm just saying, follow me as I follow him because my job is to listen to the original, to look like the original and do my best to imitate the original. So you try to follow me as I follow him. We know what the standard is. We know what it's supposed to look like. We gotta live that out. And then in Galatians chapter five, uh, verse one, it says, imitate God. This is the New Living Translation. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you're his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. There's a standard, there's a goal, there's an end game, there's the goat, it's Jesus. What you and I have to do is keep coming back to Christ, keep coming back to the cross and and saying, well, if that's what it's supposed to look like, how am I doing? If I come back to the model and and am I living like him? Am I looking more and more like him? Do I sound like him? Am I responding to pressure like Jesus showed me? Man, did he face a lot of pressure. We never see Jesus panicking and going, oh my me, I don't know what I'm gonna do. He says, no, no, like, Father, this is happening. Here's what, he goes and he says, you only see me doing what my father tells me. I'm just gonna go pray. And when he's tempted, pray. Am, am I living like Jesus? Am I responding to pressure? Am I dealing with pain the way I see Jesus deal with pain? He's hurt and he's betrayed. Father, forgive them. Father, not my will, but yours be done. We see what the the model looks like, the standard looks like. Does my life line up with the standard? Am I loving people like Jesus loved people? Am I resisting temptation like Jesus or do I give in? Like Christ, I wanna be like Christ. That's the vision, that's the standard. Am I consistent with it? If that's the model, how am I measuring up? And, And that's why, so we don't do it like your way or my way, people are like, well, what do you say to this? They, they wanna, like, I'm always the authority because I'm the pastor. Like, well, what do you believe in? What do you say? And what does this church believe? I'm like, I don't know, it's a big church. I bet this church believes a lot of things. Well, I'm saying, what do you believe? I'm not the authority. He is. We can go together back to him and we're not gonna do it my way or your way because those, but we're gonna do it his way, all right? And thank God there's a his way because if there wasn't, as Jesus says, I am the way. Otherwise, you guys would lose your way and there would be no way and you can go your own way, Fleetwood Mac. (laughs) There's one way, it's his way. He is the way, the truth, the life. He showed us, he taught us. Paul is reminding us in Philippians 2, come back to the standard, come back to the source. And it's not about your opinions and ideas, it's about his model. And just in case, okay, just in case we were tempted to miss the application and mess up specifically what part, because you know, you say, oh, you gotta be more like Jesus. What part of Jesus? What aspect of, what scene from Jesus's life? Paul says, specifically, I want you to come back to his humility, all right? His humility is the thing, here's what he says, verse three. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. God doesn't put things in the Bible that are easy. You know, he's putting them in here because they're, they're difficult. We have to attain to them. They're not instinctive to us. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is like the premier passage where Paul's reminding the church to be like Christ, and he specifically says, be like Christ in his humility. If, if you want to access his divinity, then model his humility. And this is the attribute. Why does, why does God have to remind us to be humble? Because we're not. 
right? Like the thing that most of us struggle with most of the time is pride. It, the source of most of our sin is pride. It's the one thing that's affecting all the other things in our life. It's the one thing that's usually affecting all of the relationships in our life. Me, do nothing out of selfish ambition, vain conceit, consider others more important than yourself. That's the breakdown right there. It's the thing that messes up our relationship with God and keeps us stuck in sin and stuck in our ways and stuck on ourself. So God has to call us to humility. It's the character, uh, it's the characteristic that most differentiates God from us, in my opinion. When you look at the fact that who we are and how we are, the divine antithesis is Jesus. Humility, let me put it this way, humility is the pathway of divinity. We already know, because divinity took on humanity and ex divinity expressed itself through humility. Humanity expresses itself through pride and power and coming. Divinity expressed itself through humility. It's the pathway of the divine. And Paul reminds us in Philippians 2, he says, Jesus was actually God, but he acted like a servant. We're servants who act like we're God. That's the tension. We want to be in control. We want to be in charge. We want to have it our way and insist on our will and decide what's right, what's wrong, who's in, who's out. God left the crown and exchanged it for a cross. We leave the cross and fight for the crown. He left the throne and he picked up a towel. We ignore the towel and we fight for the throne. Power, honor, glory, fame, wealth, success. We want it all and we'll do anything to get it. Jesus had it all and he left it all to become nothing for you and me. That's the amazing story. He became nothing so we could have everything in Jesus. Divinity expressed itself through humility. And God's inviting us to do the same thing, to be like Christ, to be humble, to be less, to come down off the throne, to get off the high horse, to get over ourselves, to take off the crown and take up the cross. That's the call for Christ followers. Jesus was actually God. He was in very nature God. He was actually God, but he acted like a servant. We're servants, but we wanna act like we're God. And that's the tension. And so Paul is bringing us back to what it's all about. He's raising the standard and he's like, guys, it's Jesus. And specifically, it's his humility that sets him apart, that we're missing. It's his submission, his surrender. And you know, it's, it's so important that he does it because I think mm, maybe you do this. I know sometimes I like to pick and choose. The Bible's a big book. You know, if you're looking for something to validate your values and to justify your current mindset, like you can find a verse for it, right? I'm a professional. I could do this all day. You do not want to be in an argument with me. Well, oh yeah, well, one of the verses, you know, you're having a bad day and you're ticked off. Well, you need to be more like Christ. I am like Christ. I'm flipping tables and cracking whips, right? <laughs> that's like Christ. Well, that's one scene out of Jesus's life that you're using way out of context, but we like to pick and choose. And I, I hear a lot of people talking about, well, Jesus came and he flipped tables. Well, he did it one time. But the truth is Jesus was treated more unfairly than anybody in the history of humanity. And he said, Father, forgive them when his best friends betrayed him, when, when his uh, false accusers came against him, when they rigged the justice system, when people he had allowed to be in power turned their back on him and we condemned him for committing no crime. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't really get it and, and I gotta do this for them. And Peter says, when they hurled insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And that's why Paul isn't saying, hey, I want you to be like Jesus. He's the standard. And I want you to get out there and start flipping tables in Jesus' name, okay? Start kicking tables and cracking whips. Let's go. Everybody, let's pray. You're like, yeah, I was made for this. Oh, wait, that's not the call. He said, no, everybody just calm down and be like Jesus in his humility. Submission, surrender, trust. These are not qualities of our culture. And so what I'm saying is if we're not careful, what we can do is we can take Jesus, we can take God and let us create him in our own image. It's what we do. In the beginning, he, he said, let us create man in our image. And then as man, 
who is a servant trying to be God, we said, well, let's just form the Jesus we want and not be conformed to the image that Christ is, but let's reconform Christ to our image that we already are and that we believe in. And every generation does this. And we'll try to change the Bible and God to fit what we already believe and justify our sins and our shortcomings. But when we come to Christ and we come to the cross and we say, if that's the standard, how am I doing? That's when things change. When we say, all right, Holy Spirit, if that's what the Son of God looks like, and if that's what God said I need to look like, we've got work to do. Come on in. Let's clean this place up. Let's start the process of becoming like him. Imagine if you did that right now in your most important relationships, in, in your key roles in your life right now, if you were like, okay, um, I need to be like Christ. My mindset, my attitude, my, my lifestyle, my paradigm has to shift and become like Jesus. And just in your friendships, instead of demanding to be heard and loved and needed and accepted, what if you became the servant and you were able to provide those things to the other people in your circle? I trust God will take care of those needs, but I'm taking on the form of a servant. I wanna be here to listen to you and to reach out to you and to serve your needs. And as an employee, I'm not pushing back on everything and talking behind the boss's back. I'm actually gonna serve at the highest level because I'm looking at Christ and I'm going, that's what he did. I have some kids in here. All right, kids, I don't know everybody's parents, but the parents I do know are imperfect, okay? Some of you are like, yep, you met mine. <laughs> They're imperfect. Uh, I, that's true of, like, my kids' parents are imperfect, at least one of them, Hi, and he's mic'd up right now. That's what's crazy. <laughs> They're imperfect, and it's really easy as a young person to get angry at your parents. It's a cultural norm. It's really easy to talk about them and to, to get bitter and angry, to blame things on them and be resentful. It will mess up the rest of your life. What if you were able, with God's help, to say, I'm gonna honor my father and mother, not because they're perfect, but because that's the standard that God calls me to. And so I'm gonna give them grace, I'm gonna forgive them, and I'm gonna trust God to deal with them, but I'm gonna do my part. And I'm telling you, it would change things. He says, it'll go well with you, you'll live a long life. It's a better way, it's a harder way. Married people, don't even make me say it, okay? You know most of our problems in marriage are pride, selfishness. What if we could get over ourselves and humble ourselves and serve the needs of the other person in this marriage? Instead of fighting for our rights and fighting to be right, isn't it interesting? Jesus didn't fight to be right. He was already in very nature God. He gave up his rights to fight for us, to die for us. That's the model of our life and our faith. And so with everything I'm dealing with and everything I'm feeling strongly about and everything I'm struggling with, so much of my life comes down to, will I choose to be humble like Jesus? Will, will I stop and, and look to the original? Will I pause and listen to the original, learn from the original and do my best to imitate the original? Can I let go of my self-interest and go, wait a minute, I'm not the only person that, that somebody else is interested in this too and, and they matter. Can I let go of my ambition? Can I become nothing so that God can do something so much greater with my life? That's the model, that's the challenge. And with this challenge, there's a promise, by the way. God says that humility comes with a supernatural reward. That while God opposes the proud, what does the Bible say? He gives grace, he gives favor to the humble. That he, in one verse it says he exalts the humble. That's a cool promise, that he, he will lift you up if you're willing to do this. You know, in the world, it's the powerful and the proud that get ahead, but in God's kingdom, he said, the ones who win are the, the holy and the humble will come out on top. So just trust me. You know, your mindset, your attitude has to be the same as Christ Jesus. It, it always comes down to attitude. You and I can't control the circumstances and the details and other people. We, we can only, with God's help, control our attitude. I remember when I was a young pastor, um, when I just become the lead pastor, and it was pretty common. Uh, do you guys remember? They called them successories. They would have these little pictures of like animals, and they would say things on them. I got I got a picture of an eagle, 
okay? Little on my desk. Y'all remember this? Early 2000s, we were all giving each other pictures of animals with words on them. It was a beautiful thing. I got an eagle. Somebody gave me an eagle, and it said, attitude determines altitude. And you could see this, this eagle was flying higher than any other bird in the sky. This thing's just soaring. Attitude determines altitude. And I was like, dude, this is so true. And this is what I think God is trying to say to us. How high you fly is determined by how humble you'll stay. How far you'll go is determined by how low you're willing to go. God exalts the humble and Jesus humbled himself all the way. Paul says, all the way to death, he said even to death on a cross. He came from the highest heights and he was willing to go to the lowest low for you, for me. That's the model, that's the standard, that's what it looks like to follow God and to live a life of faith. And I wanna close with this because Jesus isn't just our standard, but he's our savior. And why is that important? Well, I just preached it. I just preached about humility. Raise your hand if you didn't need it. If you raise your hand, obviously you need it the most. Okay, so (laughs) not me. I'm the most humble person in this room. Boom, you lose. I mean, it's kind of easy for a preacher to get out here and kind of rail it. You know, we should be more humble. We all busted, convicted. We already know. And and so if it was just left up to us to try on our own to do this thing that we can't do, we lose, but because we can't, he did. And so this, I love Philippians too, because it not only challenges us to become like Christ, but it reminds us of the beauty and the power of the gospel, that Jesus was in very nature God, came down from the throne to be lifted up on a cross to cover our sins, our shame, our flaws, our failure. He became nothing so you and I could have everything. He allowed himself to be rejected so we could be redeemed. And I wanna close just by giving you this opportunity because if all we did was talk about how we could be better and we miss what he did for us to bridge the gap between us and God, I think we'd miss the whole thing. But he did the thing and, and what he reminds us is that we have this gift in Christ. We need to accept the gift and acknowledge the Savior, acknowledge him as Lord. Part of what he tells us in Philippians 2 is one day everyone will. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Let me, let me read it to us again. Verse nine. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave Jesus the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, every knee is gonna bow, every tongue is gonna confess and acknowledge Jesus' Lordship. For some, it'll be too late. He came to us in humility. He's returning to us in glory. Angels, trumpets, fire, judgment. He said, I'm coming soon, be ready. That's what he told us. And, And the first time he gave his life for us on a cross, but he's coming back to redeem us because he has a place for us. I'm coming soon. If you've never accepted the free gift of God, if you've never acknowledged Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want to give you the opportunity to do that today. I'm going to close us in prayer. It's really simple, but as I pray, just tell God, I need that. I I get who you are and and you did what I needed done. And your, your son's death on the cross covers my sins and I accept that. And I want him to be my Lord and my Savior invite him in. Let me pray for us. God, today I'm amazed as I look at the the antithesis of who I am and how it's found in you, of who and how we are as humans. And we look at how divinity expressed itself in humility. It's an amazing story. The God of creation, you humbled yourself put on skin, walked among us, lived a perfect life, and then you allowed yourself to go to the cross on behalf of each one of us. And we thank you for the salvation that that gospel story brings to us if we believe it and receive it. We thank you also for the standard and what it means for our life. 
that you have come to free and rescue us from a life of self-pursuit that ends in nothing. And you're inviting us to become nothing so that we can eternally have everything in and with you. Thank you for what's waiting for us if we're willing to walk this path of humility. God, thank you for reminding us right now. I think for all of us, it was just like a, hold on, I needed this right now. Just this pause to stop the music and to go back and listen to the original. To pause, stop playing and look to the original, learn from the original and imitate you, Jesus. By your grace and your power, we're just inviting your Holy Spirit to come in and transform us, to change our minds and that our mindset, our attitude would be the same is Christ Jesus. We ask for this for our good, but Lord, for your glory, because we believe if we get there, we believe if we even start trying to get there, we could see so much change in this world. Fill your people. Let your church look like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for Real Life Online. We hope this video encouraged you. As part of our Real Life family, we want you to know that we are here for you. If you need prayer or would like to get connected to any of the resources we mentioned, you can find it all at real.life slash connect. And if you'd like to stay up to date with what God is doing here at Real Life and always know when we go live, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also find links to our website and other Real Life resources available for you in the description area below. Thanks so much for spending part of your day with us. We want you to know that God loves you, we love you, and we'll see you next time.